Dr. Howard Parade uh, on April the 5th, 1999, and the interviewer is Carl Schaefer. Uh, Dr. Parad, uh, could, you, could we begin by your telling us a little bit about how you got into social work and your early experience as a social worker? Well, Carl, it's a pleasure to see you again after all these years. You and I used to uh, have offices adjacent to each other. We had many conversations about social work, life, our families, USC, uh, and lots of other things. So it's very good to see you. It's always hard to tease out just one factor that made me want to become a social worker. There were several. As I think back over the years, going back now over 50 years, I would say that an experience I had while I was uh, in high school and later in my perhaps first year or two of college was a major factor in my choosing social work as a career. I worked as a rent collector for some property that my father managed in a very poor part of Boston, Roxbury, and near the south end of Boston. Uh, some of it blighted, I'm sure much of it now, uh, totally rehabilitated through urban renewal. And in my capacity in visiting families in those days, uh, a lot of poor people paid their rent week by week. I got to know the families, uh, not just as a rent collector, but as people who were dealing with many personal family and social problems. And I became very interested in problems of poverty, alcoholism, prostitution, spousal abuse, without knowing very much about social work. That was one factor. Another factor that influenced me was the encouragement I received from a tutor at Harvard University named Clyde Cleckhorn, an anthropologist who wrote a wonderful book called Mirror for Man. And although he encouraged me to pursue my studies in social science at Harvard, and he was a wonderful teacher and friend, really. He also suggested that I consider social work because he sensed that I was um, interested in doing, not just in the life of academe. And he himself uh, had done a lot of research among the Navajos at a time when learning about and studying the culture of Native Americans was not at all popular. And he wrote a number of books about the Navajos and really was an expert on Indian culture. So I learned from him in classes on an in social anthropology and cultural anthropology, I learned from him about uh, participant observation. And I began to uh, listen carefully to the people with whom I uh, was working in these tenement houses and did my undergraduate honors thesis on the social structure of tenement groups. And that was very informative to me. And then I began reading a lot about social welfare. Uh, I remember vividly there was a library in Emerson Hall on the Harvard campus which had a uh, complete co collection of uh, the various proceedings of what was used to be called the National Conference on Charities and Corrections. So I started with a, <laughs> and being a kind of an eager student, this had nothing to do with any courses I was taking, I started to read, and I was fascinated by social welfare history. And uh, I guess it's, that became the National Conference on Social Welfare. Uh, in later years. So that got me uh, further interested in becoming a social worker. My wife, uh, Libby, uh, then my girlfriend, was when I was in college, was also very interested in social work. And her sister dated a number of uh, very intelligent social workers. And they discouraged me from entering social work, saying it was a low-status, poorly paid profession. And this was, of course, during the Depression, 19, let's say, 40, 41. And it was only World War II that pulled us out of the recession of 1937, if you remember your history. 
So somehow or other, even though they discouraged me, they were very enthusiastic about what they were doing. Most of them were working in family agencies. And uh, I uh, was imbued with their sense of idealism. That was a factor. During the war, I had an opportunity to be assigned, uh, even though I didn't have a master's degree, as a military psychiatric social worker, which carried as did everything in the Army, uh, an MOS, a Military Occupation Specialty Number 263. And in that capacity, I took social histories of soldiers who had been in World War II and who suffered from battle or combat fatigue. And I was in the United States Army Medical Corps as a corporal, technician fifth grade, and I had the good fortune to be supervised by a person named Walt Pippert, P-I-P-P-E-R-T, who had a prized master's degree, and also to have consultation from a psychoanalyst named David Flicker, Dr. David Flicker, F-L-I-C-K-E-R. And I had read Freud uh, as a student at Harvard and uh, a few, a lot of books on social science, and uh, I began to read and almost memorize a book by Abraham Maslow called Principles of Abnormal Psychology, read and reread Freud, and the third book I read, which is, was of no use at that time, was Carl Rogers' Client-Centered Therapy, which didn't exactly help too much with psychotic individuals, but it, I learned a lot about interviewing style. And I, be, I was uh, self-taught, and the Army gave me some in-service training, and then I had the good fortune to be sent by the United States Army Medical Corps to take a few courses at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. I was stationed at a hospital in uh, near Durham, North Carolina, not far from Chapel Hill. And there, unbeknown to me, I was exposed to Rontian and functionalist theory, not knowing that this was considered <laughs> shameful. <laughs> which I learned later on. I never <laughs> felt ashamed of it. I always felt informed. And I had a marvelous teacher named Muriel McLaughlin in this course, who, uh, of course, gave me a lot of readings uh, based on, uh, well, including the writings of Jesse Taft, Virginia Robinson, and uh, Ruth Smalley, I think, uh, and others of the functionalist persuasion. And I realized that I was very interested uh, in learning more about social work practice. And so uh, as the war started to wind down, I uh, applied to and was accepted to uh, two graduate schools, University of Chicago and Boston University. And having been away from home for so long, I decided to go back to Boston and... Uh, in my graduate work, I had a wonderful experience at Boston University majoring in what was then called psychiatric social work, now would be called clinical social work. And I had uh, excellent supervisors and um, a combination which was quite innovative at that time. The first year was on the concurrent plan, two or three days of class and two or three days of field work, I forgot exactly which, or half and half. The second year was on the block plan, and uh, uh, that got me very interested in intensive clinical work. My second year internship was at the Massachusetts Mental Health Center, where I had excellent supervision and training, a lot of psychiatric consultation, learned how to work with children, and adolescents, adults. Uh, neurotic and psychotic, and uh, that's how I got into social work, and uh, it's been a long road since then, but a very, very wonderful adventure, okay? Uh, now, Howard, I know that in your early experience, you um, you worked in agencies, I, I take it, for a while, and then you decided to go back and get a doctorate at some point at Columbia, and uh, that exposed you, that and your, your later employment after graduation from your doctoral studies, uh, exposed you to a number of outstanding social workers who have 
a real historic interest now. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that experience uh, following your doctoral studies. Well, yes. Uh, I uh, was encouraged to pursue a doctorate by Florence Hollis, who was a graduate of Smith College and who was on the part-time faculty at Smith College as a visiting professor. She had been a very close personal friend of Florence Day. I don't know if that name rings a bell for you. Florence Day was had been the dean or the director of the Smith College School for Social Work prior to my being appointed as dean and professor at Smith College. And uh, she and Flor Florence Day and Florence Hollis, the two Florences, were very dear friends. So you could see that... Uh, Florence Hollis, after Florence Day's death uh, in about 1958, uh, would be interested in keeping up some tie with Smith College and with me. She had gone to Smith College. She was one of the preeminent social workers, and I was much influenced by her uh, writing and by her uh, my association with her in general. She wrote a book called Casework, a Psychosocial Therapy, and I remember encouraging her and helping her to get a publisher and participated in some of the research that she was doing on a typology of social casework, which I was very, very interested in, and so were others, including William Reed, but unfortunately, uh, although I used that material in teaching, it seemed to um, not attract people because although a lot of social workers talk about the need to study practice and build up a practice theory that really is based on practices that is actually conducted, when push came to shove and it was time to do the research, including at times tedious content analysis and tests of reliability and validity and all sorts of statistical tests, uh, coefficients of uh, um, correlation and all that sort of thing, a lot of social workers <laughs> turned away from that. <laughs> but I stuck with it, and I used that material a lot in my teaching, especially at USC in the uh, Ph.D. program. Well, so Florence Hollis uh, was very important, and she encouraged me to pursue a doctorate at Columbia. And I did that, and I'm glad I did. And uh, I wanted to broaden myself, so I had a combination of concentrations, which was quite possible in those days, including community organization, social policy, which uh, I studied with Eveline Burns, also a very famous person, I believe an economist by discipline, extremely demanding, intelligent, challenging, provocative woman. <laughs> and uh, I also uh, took courses with Lucille Austin. No, no, I didn't take courses with her. She was my advisor for a while, Lucille Austin, who had also taught at Smith. So it was a very close relationship between many of the faculty members at Columbia and Smith, you know, including Alfred Kahn, who had taught research, Herman Stein, who also taught at Smith, but by that time was not at Columbia. Uh, let's see who else. Uh, there were a lot of psychiatrists who uh, were very sympathetic toward Columbia and Smith, both being schools that emphasized the psychodynamic approach to the teaching of social casework theory and practice. Uh, my doctoral study was uh, rich for me. I took many courses uh, uh, outside of the School of Social Work. I had the good fortune to attend, to attend many lectures by Robert Merton, very famous sociologist. Another one uh, with whom I was very impressed uh, wrote the book, The Academic Marketplace. I forget his name at the moment. I'm embarrassed to do that. But uh, uh, he was excellent. Also, a course that helped me, uh, two courses I took very much in my research, were taught by Herbert Hyman, who wrote the classic definitive book at the time on survey research. And he was a very stimulating teacher. 
uh, I appreciated him more than perhaps some of the younger students did at the time. There was a student rebellion on the Columbia campus at that time, and many of the students, unfortunately, would read newspapers during his lectures, and I felt like strangling them. But I uh, listened attentively and got to know him quite well and learned a great deal from him, which helped me in my research activities. That gives you a kind of a sampling of some of the people at Columbia. Right. Uh, now, Howard, could you comment about uh, what was going on in the profession itself during those early years of the uh, following the war and the early 50s? Uh, what was the uh, nature of social work practice at that time? Carl, you do ask some good questions. Well, uh, you and I graduated, got our MSWs at approximately the same time. I actually finished in December 1947, got my degree awarded in May or June 1948. My first job was in a uh, district office of the Family Service Association of Greater Boston in what is called the South End of Boston, which was then a Skid Row area. I remember being assigned to a cubicle in a basement office of a public health building, and all I could see when I looked up was were the feet of pedestrians who were walking by in the street because it was a basement office and there was a little window up there. So these were, shall we say, not rather elegant surroundings. I had a uh, kind of an old-fashioned, rigorous supervisor named Dorothy G. Burpee, B-U-R-P-E-E, -E, who uh, shared with me the dilemmas which she was going through as director of this district office in making the transition from giving relief which family agencies used to do, and moving toward casework counseling. And there were many debates going on and many heated staff meetings. Public assistance at that time was uh, extremely inadequate and inconsistent and unreliable. And the Family Service of, or I think it was called Family Society of Greater Boston, had been called the Family Welfare Society and had a rather large endowment with numerous funds for the giving of relief to the worthy or deserving poor. But the agency did not wish to do uh, as a private service, social service, what public welfare was mandated to do by statute, namely provide maintenance and support for people who were unable to work and who were poor. So there were many debates about, shall we continue to give relief? Uh, shall we only do counseling, or shall we combine the two? It was a kind of enactment of the old Hegelian dialectic, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. I guess the thesis was, let's continue to give relief. The antithesis was, let's only do counseling. And the synthesis was, let us give financial aid, but only when we have, and I remember this vividly, what they then called a casework plan. Uh, in other words, if someone wanted help with a problem in marital relationships, or parent-child relationships, or in their adjustment to the workplace, and also was poor, as long as we had a plan, we could give them some money to supplement uh, public welfare. As uh, time went on, within a few years, the giving of supplementary assistance uh, waned, and uh, the major function of the family agency was personal and family counseling, and in this case, family life education. So that was a big argument. There was a big argument at that time. Grace Marcus had written an article on the use of relief as a tool. There was much controversy. Do you happen to recall this yourself? Now, it may have been different on the West Coast, uh, but in New England, there were many private charities, um, which were outgrowths of the COS, the Charity Organization Society movement, which, as you know, was a forerunner of the modern family agency, right? Am I remembering my history? God knows I've taught this for a number of years. So uh, 
just on a personal reminiscence, uh, there were times in my work with families, mostly poor and working class people, when I knew they didn't have enough money. Uh, for example, I was working with a family, I remember this so vividly, uh, a woman came for help with her daughter, who was a teenager, very bright but underachieving in school and promiscuous. We later learned that she had been molested, really raped, by an uncle and was acting out uh, in typical adolescent fa fashion, suffering from a lot of inner turmoil. And uh, she was doing very poorly in public school and showed a lot of strength. And I was supervising what we then called a caseworker, what we would now call clinical social worker, or in fancy language, a psychotherapist. I was supervising a young woman who was happened to be a graduate of Smith College, extremely intelligent. And she said, you know, Howard, uh, this girl, we'll just call her Nancy, should be in a private school. She's extremely bright, and she's very much at risk in this toxic environment. This uncle is a predator. This was before uh, molestation uh, was reported to the authorities, and no one did very much about it in those days. Let's say this is around 1949-50. And... I took advantage of one of these little charity funds that I learned about for which the agency served as a trustee, and it was called, interestingly, the Burnham, B-U-R-N-H-A-M, Fuel Fund for deserving families who did not have enough wood, coal, or other fuel to heat their homes during the harsh New England winter. So I wanted to send help my staff member. I was then a district director myself. I got promoted quickly. <laughs> uh, I wanted to help uh, the caseworker who was assigned to Nancy uh, to be able to send this girl to private school where we thought she would do well, but we didn't have the money. So I applied to the coal fund. I asked the mother uh, how she heated her house, and she said, buy coal. So I said, well, we're going to get some, try to get some money for you so you can pay for the coal. And I had to give her a wink, which would now be considered very unprofessional. And I told the mother that she can then use the money she would have paid for fuel toward tuition for her daughter to go to a private school. Well, this was not exactly kosher, but that's how we survived in those days. Uh, I was a great believer in action. If a kid needed something, a family needed something, I would sort of knock myself out to do it. So that's how I dealt with the, the relief problem at times. Not in every case, obviously. Okay? That's one example. Uh, perhaps you have another question. Uh, well, you sort of slided over the idea, the fact that you had been appointed to a dean of the uh, uh, Smith School of Social Work, which is a very prestigious school, uh, then and now. Uh, and I wondered if you could say a little bit more about the academic um, uh, experience uh, that you began at that time. And also, um, it has occurred to me that during that period at least, and maybe even to this day, uh, the social work in the East uh, was practiced with a little different uh, 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 emphasis than here in the West. I mean, what eventually developed in the West had started in the East, so that you were in a in a place where um, uh, leadership in the profession was actually uh, resided. And so, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that whole experience as the dean of the school. Well, again, you ask a question that's dear to my heart. Uh, I uh, invested a great deal of time and energy, blood, sweat, and a few tears into my former incarnation as dean of the Smith College School for Social Work. I felt lucky to have that job, uh, and it was like a dream come true for me. Uh, I had a chance to work for a brief period uh, with Annette Garrett, who was the associate dean when I was there. I was there from 19... 
1956 to 1971 before I came to USC. I want to point out, though, that the longest tenure I had in, throughout my career of well over 50 years was at USC. So I don't want to minimize that for a minute because I had 17 good years, really good years at USC, which I, uh, the memory of which I also cherish. Back to Smith. As most everybody knows, Smith College School for Social Work is one of the leading schools, perhaps even distinguished, I can say that because I inherited the job, I didn't create it, for the teaching of uh, a, a kind of psychodynamic approach to clinical social work, based largely on a combination of psychoanalytic and psychosocial theories of behavior and intervention. So that Smith College was very influential in educating and training uh, initially only young women, and later, uh, because of my stubborn and persistent efforts, we were able to accept men as degree candidates in what was then called social case work. We would now call clinical social work or psychotherapy. So I had an opportunity to be really... Uh, intimately engaged uh, in planning curriculum, in recruiting faculty, uh, not so happily engaged in fundraising and getting NIMH training and research grants in order to keep the program going. But I saw the program at Smith uh, continue to evolve and uh, uh, keeping its psychodynamic base very much intact we were able to add a lot of socio-cultural theory to the curriculum. If you will recall, there was a period when the Russell Sage Foundation was encouraging the incorporation of social science theory into the social work curriculum. Herman Stein, with Richard Cloward at Columbia, had edited an excellent book called something like Socio-Cultural Theory and Social Work Practice. Uh, at the University of Michigan, there was a lot of emphasis on the integration of social science and social work. And I was able to uh, introduce course content in that area. One of the teachers uh, was Dr. Jerome or Jay Cohen, whom I'm sure you know, uh, uh, who went on and was at Smith for a few years. He helped us develop the social science content because he had a doctorate in sociology or social science as well as a master's in social work. So that was an exciting development. During most of my tenure at Smith, the theoretical inspiration came from ego psychology. Annette Garrett had done a series of lectures and had done some writing on ego psychology and its contribution to what she called dynamic casework. And I uh, collected a number of her papers and other papers, and I guess the first book I did was called Ego Psychology and Dynamic Casework, which I think had some uh, impact on the field. Then I did a follow-up volume with Roger Miller called Ego-Oriented Casework, and those two books, I think, were very much in the Smith tradition, uh, drawing as they did on the use of psychoanalytic theory in helping people with personal, family, and other interpersonal problems. One of the common criticisms of uh, Smith was that we were training junior psychoanalysts. I never appreciated that comment because... I was very much oriented toward the person in the environment. And while Smith had many excellent psychoanalytic teachers on its faculty, they were not, we were not training the students to become psychoanalysts, but rather to become informed and skilled social workers. I think one of the uh, important aspects of the Smith program was the block plan which allowed three summers of 10 weeks each of very intensive academic preparation with two intervening winter internships. And because of its location, as well as for reasons of uh, ideology, the school was able, 
and had to, even if it wasn't able, had to pick affiliate, affiliated training centers for fieldwork internships all over the country so that we were able to pick the best training centers, mostly interdisciplinary, all over the country in those days, all the way from Boston to um, Denver, Colorado, and from Milwaukee to Falls Church, Virginia, outside of Washington, D.C. So the block plan was a prominent feature of the Smith program, and I guess to summarize briefly, the emphasis on ego psychology, especially the work of Eric Erickson, Hartman, Chris Lowenstein, among others, uh, the uh, continued uh, uh, emphasis on keeping the social and social work through a psychosocial approach, uh, the high quality of the students and the faculty, all made my 15 years of experience at Smith very rich and memorable. Uh, Howard, one of the things that you are uh, most noted for, uh, among many, uh, is your work in crisis intervention. And could you tell me about your, the origin of your interest in that and how you came to work in that particular area? Well, uh, you might say I've labored in the crisis intervention vineyard for well over 30 years, but I'll try to give you a brief answer. Uh, there's always a peculiar conca concatenation of motivations and circumstances that makes anything happen in this world. I had worked in family service of Boston for about seven years, and as I indicated earlier, I, after being there a year or two, I became a supervisor and then a district director and uh, I would say at least five or six of those years were devoted intensive, uh, to intensive clinical work, working with children and families. And a friend of mine told me that there was a new project at Harvard University uh, concerned with the uh, studying of how families respond, how ordinary families respond to extraordinary stressful events such as the birth of twins, the birth of premature babies, the diagnosis of tuberculosis, and other medical conditions such as congenital, the birth of a child with a congenital anomaly that were routinely reported in the public health register so that it was possible to reach out to these families that were exposed to these stressful events. And Dr. Gerald Kaplan was the head of a project called the Harvard Family Guidance Center. And he, uh, in turn, reported to Dr. Eric Lindemann. Both of them were, uh, well, I hope Dr. Kaplan is still alive. Dr. Lindemann died some years ago. Outstanding psychoanalysts, outstanding human beings. And like myself, very much interested not only in psychological phenomena, but very much interested in the interrelationship between psyche and society, the individual and his or her culture. I had met Eric Lindemann as an undergraduate at Harvard many years earlier when uh, he attended a group tutorial at which I presented the findings of my honest thesis on the social structure of tenement groups. And he was... Uh, rather fascinated with my study and spoke to me about it and I was honored that a person of his stature would pay attention to a thesis written by an undergraduate I must have been only 19 or 20 years old at the time and as it turned out Eric Lindemann uh, was a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and head of the Department of Psychiatry at a Harvard-affiliated hospital called the Massachusetts General Hospital. And he was also head of the Division of Mental Health of the School of Public Health of Harvard University. So he interviewed me for the job, and he remembered me, and he uh, approved of my application. Dr. Kaplan interviewed me for on three occasions for nine hours. He was very particular about who was going to get the job. He had a lot of candidates, even though the salary was typical of the salaries at the time, that is to say, uh, 
very low. <laughs> At any rate, uh, I was hired as a research associate and lecturer at Harvard University School of Public Health. And my job was to interview families who were exposed to the conditions I previously mentioned, birth of a baby with congenital anomalies, birth of twins, uh, or where there was a diagnosis of tuberculosis. We also studied for a shorter period the impact of a diagnosis of RH negative uh, on a pregnant woman. I would visit the families at home following the birth of the baby and would also visit with them when they came to the uh, pediatric clinic where they were cared for by Harvard Medical School students and pediatricians. In return for their cooperation with the study, the families were given excellent free medical and nursing care and nutritional counseling. And my job at first was just to study the impact of these stressful events. And we gradually built up a kind of theoretic paradigm whereby we could identify those families for whom a stressful event became a crisis. And in that paradigm, we had a configuration of at least four interrelated factors. One, the actual event, let's say birth of unexpected, in many cases, twins. Because many of these mothers were poor, most of them were poor, very poor, and they did not get prenatal care. Many of them did not. So uh, we would study, I would go into the home with uh, the tape recorders of that time, which were rather monstrous in size compared with today's electronic equipment. This was before... VCR video equipment was available, but I became very interested, and I would tape record the interview uh, looking at the objective stress, the meaning of the stress that had occurred, as well as the subjective perception of the stress and how people responded to the stress in the light of that perception and how they resolved the subsequent problems. So the crisis, stress crisis configuration consisted of these elements. The actual stress, its objective and subjective meaning, its perception, how people actually behaved or responded, and how they adapted. Lindemann's theory, based on the Coconut Grove disaster, was that if we worked with people at a time of high anxiety or disequilibrium, or crisis, if you will, putting it very, rather loosely, we could help steer most people toward the adaptive and away from the maladaptive end of the problem-solving and coping spectrum. And that's exactly what he had done with the relatives of, the survivors of, the victims of the Coconut Grove nightclub disaster. Coconut Grove was the name of a nightclub in a part of Boston uh, near the South End where the fire and zoning laws were probably liberally interpreted because there was a lot of graft and corruption during that period. The mayor of Boston, himself later jailed and re-elected from jail, was James Michael Curley, uh, a legendary figure. And because of the poor fire and safety provisions, many people were stampeded to death, at least I'm sorry to say a couple of hundred. I'm going by memory here. Eric Lindemann, a very innovative social psychiatrist, uh, way ahead of his time, reached out to the survivors of those uh, victims who were killed and wanted to help them with what he called the crisis of bereavement through a brief period of intervention, which he called preventive crisis of intervention preventive because he was able to locate people who seemed to have a poor prognosis for healthy grief work and actively help them grapple, grapple with their sorrow, their pain, their guilt. And he wrote a classic article which appeared in my book on crisis intervention, which was published around 1964 or 5. The article was entitled Symptomatology and Management of Acute Grief. It was an extension of Freud's theory of mourning and melancholia, 
but updated and very, very specific. Kubler-Ross borrowed very, very heavily from Lindemann's stages of grief work, and I regret that she didn't fully acknowledge her debt to him, but seemed to capitalize on it as if it were all original with her, which frankly it was not. Whoever hears this or reads this, I want you to know <laughs> that Lindemann acknowledged his debt to Freud, but Kubler-Ross never fully acknowledged her debt as a scholar and as an investigator to Eric Lindemann. Lindemann was astonished by the fact that so many people were responsive to his efforts at helping them cope more adaptively with grief and built up a theoretic framework uh, uh, leading to community mental health programming with a lot of emphasis on what he called primary prevention or early secondary prevention in the community using brief or time-limited modes of intervention to locate people experiencing life crises and helping them resolve them through what we knew then about how the ego copes with stress. So ego psychology was probably, along with sociocultural theory, uh, the main source of knowledge in that area. Lindemann elaborated his ideas uh, with uh, a lot of imagination and creativity and developed a program at the Wellesley Human Relations Services outside of Boston, about 20 miles from Boston, which was a prototype for the community mental health programming that followed in the 60s. And Gerald Kaplan, who wrote more prolifically than Lindemann, wrote several books on community mental health and mental health consultation and crisis intervention. So I was in an environment that was just uh, indescribably uh, exciting uh, uh, and rich in terms of encouraging uh, innovation and research. And in my work with families after the research phase was completed, I received permission, I had to get permission, from Gerald Kaplan and Eric Lindemann to try some experimental intervention. First, we wanted to see how families cope without intervention. But I couldn't stay uh, uh, in the role of mere participant observer. I wanted to be more active. So it was then that I experimentally uh, tried to use some of Lindemann's and Kaplan's principles. And my own experience in family agency work was very helpful to uh, reach out to families who ordinarily would never be helped. And again, like Lindemann, I saw some amazingly dramatic results occurring in a short period of time. Lydia Rappaport was a colleague at that time. She was getting a Master's of Public Health, I believe, at Harvard. And she and I would make home visits together. She wrote a few excellent papers on her experience. And that's how crisis intervention came into my life or how I got imbued with the crisis intervention bug many years ago was particularly active at Harvard from 1954 to 56, but continued the interest ever since then. Um, Howard, uh, after you left Smith, uh, you, did, you came to, to USC uh, as professor and, as you said, spent 17 years there. Um, during that period of time, could you reflect on what was going on in the profession and how it gradually evolved? Because you've already made a few references to the differences between the way things were and the way they are now. And even in terms of, of what we call people, we used to call them psychiatric social workers. We no longer refer to them that way anymore. We talk about clinical social work, which was an unknown, it was casework before. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, I actually... Oh, like this? Well, you know. talking to this whole thing. Oh, talking to that. I'm sorry, I was talking to that one. Okay. Well, I came to USC in uh, August of 1971. Oh, goodness. Hold on just a minute. Shut that up. Lola Selby, the late Lola Selby, who was a lovely, uh, conscientious uh, person, was assigned to help me learn about USC and the Los Angeles community, and I must say she was extremely helpful, and I 
to this day feel a great gratitude to her and mourn her passing a few years ago. She was a dear friend and a wonderful social worker. Uh, what I noticed uh, that was different about the West Coast as compared to the East Coast was, first of all, um, there was uh, much more independence on the part of social work practitioners in carrying out their practice assignments. And some of that, I thought, was very healthy in terms of reflecting a sense of personal and professional autonomy. But as I began to visit in those days, the uh, classroom faculty also did fieldwork liaison, which I'm sure you remember, Carl. That was changed, I think. It was not a wise decision, in my opinion, to split fieldwork faculty uh, assignments from the classroom. But in visiting many agencies, uh, uh, including some of the excellent ones we had at USC as training centers for the interns, I uh, noticed that a lot of not just students but staff members were not receiving the kind of supervision and consultation which I thought was vital for their own professional development and in order to be really effective practitioners. In other words, the atmosphere was much more freewheeling and permissive. Well, Southern California is different from New England, I would say that. Another change that I noticed was that a lot of the agencies did not have large endowments, which was typical of some of the older clinics, hospitals, and social agencies of the East, which had uh, uh, their roots in uh, various kinds of charitable institutions and had an endowment. So there was a lot more emphasis in the West Coast on payment of services, and uh, the focus was, perhaps it had to be, much more entrepreneurial than I thought would be desirable for a profession like social work, which is should be largely concerned with the underprivileged. A third change which I noticed was that private practice, and I think this was related to the other things I've just mentioned, was much livelier here, although it certainly had a strong tradition in the East. But uh, you yourself, Carl, were one of the early private practitioners, extending the benefits of uh, counseling to middle-class and upper-middle-class persons. And I thought that was an excellent development. Another thing which I noticed, uh, which was very important, was the uh, excitement, well, I was aware of, the excitement of working in a multi-ethnic community. Los Angeles uh, uh, had many uh, African Americans and Hispanic persons, and uh, uh, that was very exciting to me. Uh, as a uh, teacher and as someone who, soon after my arrival, also had a very small but enjoyable part-time practice. Those were some of the things I noticed. Uh, uh, all of these are interrelated. There was much less emphasis in Southern California on having access to psychoanalytic consultation than there was in the East. Much less emphasis on detailed process or carefully, systematically done diagnostic recordings and case records. A lot freer, looser. So we had the advantage of freedom and the disadvantage of probably uh, not really offering, how shall I say this, <laughs> the best possible services to our clients. A little... Uh, I think some compromises were made, which I don't think was good for clients or the profession. Uh, that was in the 70s. I had the good fortune of uh, using my so-called release day. USC gave us, I think it was Tuesdays off, to work as a consultant with the Center for Training in Community Psychiatry, which was headed by a psychiatrist named Dr. Arnold Beiser. And the social worker who really administered the program was a graduate of USC named Helen Oland, O-L-A-N-D-E-R. And a number of USC faculty were associated with that program, including you, Carl Schaefer, Sam Taylor, uh, 
and uh, I think Jim Carls, who was not on the faculty but got his doctorate at USC, was there as an administrator. Well, that my association uh, with that program brought me in touch with literally hundreds of practitioners who came for continuing education in the uh, part of the curriculum which I was responsible for, namely emergency mental health, which included crisis intervention, family therapy, brief therapy, and special attention to the work of the psychiatric social workers in the Department of Mental Health who were involved in aftercare of mental patients um, for reasons which were largely based on economy and misguided economy, I would say. Governor Reagan emptied out the mental hospitals because now we had the psychotropic medication that could be used and many mentally ill people were in the community but without the social supports, without the help, without the finances, the job training, the uh, resources which they needed to be able to survive in the community after being in a mental hospital such as Camarillo or Norwalk for extended periods. So my job with the State Department of Mental Health was to help train these workers really to avert crises uh, because without the support and without the medication that they needed, many of these mentally ill persons were part of a revolving door phenomenon. That is, they wouldn't take their medication, they would decompensate, they would show up at, let's say, Metropolitan Hospital in Norwalk, California, or other clinics, or a PET, a psychiatric emergency team worker, would have to hospitalize them against their wishes. That was a very exciting period from approximately 1971 or 2 to about 1979. I was there for about seven years when, uh, because of economies in the state government, my assignment from the State Department of Health was um, terminated. The bureaucratic language, I recall, was I had a permanent assignment for zero hours per week. They did that to keep me from suing them, although I would never have sued them, because another thing I learned about California is it's very litigation-oriented. <laughs> I chuckle over this because it's very different from my life in small New England towns where a handshake was your... Well, your, your honor was based on a handshake, and not everything was in writing, and not everybody always sued everybody. But uh, country boy got used to the big city. <laughs> that was a very also exciting, rich period, uh, uh, learning a lot about the mental health system, about the Lanterman Petrus Short Act, trying to apply concepts and principles of crisis intervention to diverse, multi-ethnic, highly at-risk populations, dealing with state bureaucracies. California had slipped a lot from its golden age when Pat Brown was governor, and his son, Jerry, did not do as well for mental health and social welfare as had the father. Carl, you probably know more about that than I. That gives you a flavor of what I experienced. No, I'm going to. Uh, Howard, now that you're nearing the end of your career, as you look back retrospectively over the years that you've been in social work, which is now well over 50, um, do you have any comments or observations that you'd like to make? Well, well Carl, in um, preparation for today, I did a lot of thinking, and I uh, reminds me of my years... Uh, teaching I always had enough material for at least two classes and and I obviously uh, took extensive notes but some of the things I'd like to comment on that I look back on are positive very positive some are negatively tinged and some are a mix so if I may uh, just mention a couple of things uh, not necessarily in order of importance but I recall in an informal conversation, you mentioned to me that our lives, your career and mine, proceeded, interestingly, 
along parallel tracks at a time when neither of us knew each other. You worked at Hawthorne Cedars Knowles of J Jewish Board of Guardians in New York, outside of New York City in Westchester County, right? In 1948, and in that very same year I was offered a job there. I went into family service in Boston and you went that way. So you are obviously interested in and have done, I've heard you give a lecture or two on child therapy. When I was in Boston, in a family agency, I would try to refer children who were emotionally disturbed to clinics like the Judge Baker Guidance Center or the Thome Clinic or other clinics. And I used to be so frustrated because I would be told often that the child either didn't meet the criteria that they had for pleasing the psychiatric residents who were in training there, which I thought was absurd, it's supposed to be the other way around, that you're supposed to adapt the therapy to fit the needs of the child or family, not have the family <laughs> adapt their needs to fit the training needs of the therapist. And I was extremely frustrated and even outraged by the long waiting lists, often saying, try us next year, failing to recognize, as they did, that the child was by definition in his or her formative years and timing was important. So at that time, I recall approaching one of the psychoanalytic consultants we had at Family Service of Boston, who was a very gifted person who loved social workers, named Irving Kaufman. He wrote a book with Beatrice Simcox called Work with Parents of the Impulse-Ridden Characters Disordered Child. Do you recall his work at all? Okay. Well, he was very gifted in working with delinquents and pre-delinquents. And I told him, since he was on the staff at Judge Baker, how frustrated I was. And he was a guy who, unlike a lot of analysts who are unapproachable, he was very approachable, quiet, and brilliant, and excellent with children. So I asked if he would help me to learn. And he said, in this characteristic, quiet, unassuming way, sure. <laughs> so I began to work with children. At that time in Boston, which was very orthodox, social workers were not encouraged or even allowed to work with in doing direct treatment of children through play therapy or any other form of therapy, art therapy. The theory then prevalent was you had to be an MD to do that, and not only an MD, but a child analyst or a child psychiatrist. I thought it was utterly absurd because there were social workers who had hundreds of kids on their caseloads in the public social services in, um, you know, who were in foster care or uh, who were abused and required protection. So that was something I was very interested in. And when I was the district director of a suburban family service office, I did set up a program in child therapy and parent-child counseling. I was very proud of that. I'm mentioning some of the things that just come to my mind. I also benefited greatly from courses at the Boston Psychoanalytic Society, uh, which were applicable to social work, and uh, uh, that has stood me well throughout my career. I picked a, I'm just going to take a couple of things on my list that I wanted to mention. At Smith College, School for Social Work, when I was dean, I was particularly proud of three, among other things, that we were able to do. One was uh, being able to admit men into the master's degree and doctoral programs at Smith. I challenged the uh, Board of Trustees at Smith College, who said it was a, Smith College is a women's college, by saying, well, you know, there's a five-college program in Western Massachusetts involving collaboration among uh, the following institutions of higher education, Amherst College, which is very prestigious, University of Massachusetts, Mount Holyoke, and Smith, and Hampshire College, which was an innovative independent college. And there are men in the classrooms at Smith with the women, and there are women who go to these other campuses, and they share classroom learning with men. That was not in Sophia Smith's codicil. And I... Uh, as it were, took this on as a cause. The first time I approached the trustees, I lost. I figured I would. The second time, 
they were lukewarm, and the third time we hit a home run. <laughs> Because it would have been three strikes and you're out otherwise. <laughs> and I was proud of that. I was also proud of a program, a liberal program of financial aid, whereby almost 85 or 88 percent of the students had some form of scholarship aid. Since social workers receive such low salaries, I devoted myself to raising money and try to have as many paid field work assignments as I could. But instead of having the money go directly from the agency to the student, with some getting less than they needed and some getting more, mostly less, of course, I persuaded the executives of the affiliated training centers who were willing to participate in the program, along with the help of many colleagues at Smith. I certainly didn't do it all by myself to contribute to what I called an agency scholarship fund, a pool, and asked if they would trust us, a small committee of two or three people, to put all the money in a pool each academic or fieldwork internship year and then do the best we could on the basis of the student situation to give them small, medium, or large scholarships, mostly small, a few medium, <laughs> very few large. Uh, without any commitment on the part of the student to be pushed or forced to work for that agency or in that field of practice. Because I thought that it was very important that students be free to decide where they wanted to go. In those days, especially the 50s and 60s, remember there was a personnel shortage in social work, and uh, there were uh, also many waiting lists at clinics and hospitals, so there were plenty of jobs, even though the pay was poor. Well, I was delighted that the agency and clinic people with whom we worked at Smith were positive in their response. When I would go to a meeting of the deans and directors of schools of social work at the CSWE, Council of Social Work Education, many of them would say, Howard, you make us look bad because we have only commitment scholarships at our school, or primarily commitment scholarships, and here you are... Uh, ranting and raving, well, I don't think I was ranting or raving, but certainly propagandizing about scholarships without commitment. So so you make us look bad. So I said, that's my whole idea. <laughs> the worse you look, the better. Uh, this is tape two uh, of the interview with uh, Dr. Howard Parad. So I was still reminiscing the retrospective view down memory lane. So I mentioned um, child therapy being done directly by social workers with proper training and consultation. I mentioned my interest um, in uh, liberal scholarship aid for students uh, as a way of attracting promising students into social work. For a while I was chairman of a group which I helped start called the uh, Massachusetts Social Work Recruitment Committee. I was very proud of that. At a time in the 50s when we had a shortage of applicants in schools of social work, although we had a great need for services after the war, I recall that in an effort to bring social work to the attention of college students, a group of colleagues and I developed summer internship programs for juniors in college in an attempt to interest them in the possibility of pursuing graduate study in social work. And since Massachusetts has so many colleges and universities, we had access to many very bright young men and women, and many agencies were willing to provide um, uh, even small stipends for the students to work as case aides. And that was a very successful program. We had two or three meetings during the summer. We gave them lectures, and we had discussion groups. And I must say I was impressed with the zeal and the intuitive uh, wisdom of many of these young men and women who had never studied social work, and certainly many of them had not studied sociology or psychology. And quite a few went on to graduate schools in social work. That was a wonderful positive experience. Uh, a couple of anecdotal reminiscences that are sobering in their implication. In some of these busy 
especially the public agencies where certain which had certain families on their caseloads which were called for lack of a better term I think it's a horrible term chronic crisis ridden multi-problem families do you remember Carl the interest in the multi-problem families so many of the supervisors who participated in this special summer recruitment program figured these families were so mixed up so disturbed uh, they might as well assign some of them to the case aides, the students from places like Harvard and Tufts and Boston University and University of Massachusetts and other colleges and universities in the greater Boston area. What harm could they do since the staff didn't know what to do with them? Well, many of these student volunteers or case aides uh, because of their enthusiasm and lack of stereotypes, lack of bias, lack of prejudice, and just their love of humanity and their warmth, were able to relate to many of these families much more effectively because they looked at the world with a kind of an idealistic, wide-open, optimistic eye, eye, whereas these seasoned professionals who were beaten down uh, and low in morale and burnt out, often viewed these same families with a jaundiced eye, always volunteering that the prognosis was very guarded. And the deal we made was that the supervisor wouldn't say anything like that to the students, just say, why don't you do what you can? Here's a little summary we have of the family. See how you can help them. Well, the students did unorthodox things, for example, visiting an ADC mother who, let's say, had three or four kids out of wedlock and maybe drank a lot and had a lot of boyfriends and wasn't too skilled in, uh, as a parent, it's somewhat neglectful, if not abusive. So students would tell us stories like this, and I remember them, some of them quite vividly. A student would say, I uh, made a home visit on making this up Monday afternoon, and although it was 2 or 3 o'clock, uh, the dishes were piled in the sink, the kids hadn't eaten, the baby's diaper was loaded, the mother was watching TV and sipping wine and smoking cigarettes. Instead of saying, gosh, this is terrible, the student would say something like this to the woman. Let's say it was a woman student. I remember one in particular, very bright, say, wow, no wonder you're depressed. With, them, with all these kids and all this pressure and not much money, let me pitch in. And bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, the student would roll up her sleeves, as it were, and um, clear up the dishes, wash the dishes, uh, help diaper the baby, uh, ask the mother if she could make her a bowl of hot soup, open a can of soup for her, <laughs> maybe bring some food with her, and in that way form a kind of woman-to-woman -woman relationship. And then they would sit down and have a cup of coffee or a bowl of soup, and the ADC mother would volunteer you know, information about her problems, and the student would counsel her in her own best way. And uh, at the end of the uh, eight- or ten-week summer period, many of these clients missed their case aids. <laughs> they had, in other words, a relationship. So that was so exciting to me, and of course now we know how there's a sort of trained incapacity on the part of many professionals uh, to bring such biases to the therapeutic endeavor that they're unable to help people. That was a tremendous learning experience for me and for the supervisors. Not that it happened each and every time, but it happened frequently enough for me to remember it about uh, 40 years later. Okay? I want to go on to something else that also left me with a feeling of great satisfaction and excitement. Long before the Civil Rights Act was passed, when I was at Smith College, my wife Libby and I wanted to recruit more Hispanic and black students at Smith College, which was in those days a kind of uh, waspy center, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant women many of them who came to the undergraduate college, rich enough to bring their own horses with them so we used to call them, not too graciously, the horsey set. And you didn't see many faces with, of people with color. Uh, it was very difficult to get grants at that time because uh, Richard Nixon was president of the United States, had impounded most of the money that we were ordinarily getting for training grants from NIMH. But I happened to meet a... Uh, member of the French department
department at Smith College, who uh, struck up an acquaintance with me at the faculty club when we were having lunch one day, uh, because I had offered some informal counseling to a student majoring in French. It had nothing to do with French or my lack of knowledge of that. But she had personal and family problems, and the student went back to her French teacher and said uh, Howard Parad was helpful. Uh, he's at the School of Social Work. Uh, I didn't know we had a School of Social Work at Smith College. There we were, and nobody knew about us. So this woman, whose name was um, Mademoiselle Sturm, S-T-U-R-M, became very interested in our program and said that she knew a Smith College alumna who, wanted, who was a benefactress and wanted to do a good deed. She was getting on in years and wanted to do something very useful. And did I have a special project for which there was no government funding? Well, of course, I embraced Mademoiselle Straub. I had about 15 such projects, and I didn't know which one to pick. So my wife, Libby, Libby was then on the faculty at Smith College teaching social policy, and uh, I developed a program whereby we again reached out to college juniors, but this time we had as our target college juniors from what were then called Negro colleges, black colleges in the South, who would usually not aspire to go to graduate school, A, and B, if they did, they would not aspire to go to a graduate school such as the one offered by Smith College because they didn't have the money and it just was not part of their world. So we developed a program whereby we would offer um, black college students in their junior year, between their junior and senior year, and Hispanic students, that would be uh, Puerto Rican students largely from the greater New York area or New Haven or Hartford or Boston, who might be interested in social work, a chance to take two courses. One was in social science theory, and the other was in communication. We made the mistake of first entitling these as remedial courses. That was a mistake, because that tended to assault or threaten the student's self-esteem. And my wife had a brother, unfortunately died a few years later, named Leonard, who was a professor of English at Mich at University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And he uh, was very interested in the black experience, and he even wrote a book on black English, very interested in what we now call ethnic or cultural sensitivity. And he had friends at Tuscaloosa, and he told us first, do not use the word remediation, use the word enrichment. And uh, I thought that was helpful because it wasn't enrichment. And secondly, he said, when you send out the leaflets, which we did, and we were shocked, nobody was responding, he said, that's because no one believes you, no one trusts you. Why would a white college, women's college, uh, offer blacks a free summer of education at Smith and a complete scholarship to the Smith College Graduate School if they accepted and are qualified. And also, uh, they're poor. They can't afford to come, even if it's free. So I went back to Mademoiselle Sturm and explained my dilemma to her. And we developed a learn while you earn or earn while you learn program. We paid the students ex uh, transportation expenses, whether bus fare, train, or airfare. And we gave them board and room, free tuition, and $50 a week, which, let's say, in the year 1960 or 61 was a lot of money. It was pretty good. So they could afford to come. And then my brother-in-law took these leaflets to Tuscaloosa and told his black friend, colleagues in the black colleges about the program, that it was for real, that it was not a fake, uh, that it was not any sort of deception. And we had plenty of applicants, um, black and Hispanic students, and that was very, very exciting. Jay Cohen taught them a course on social science theory, which was really a course on how to conceptualize. And we had a person who was very interested in teaching um, 
students from other cultures who taught a course basically on communication, teaching them more uh, how to write more effectively. And uh, the students actually enjoyed the courses. We had a recreational coordinator so that it wasn't all work. They had plenty of chance to play. And quite a few of them went on to graduate school. A few got scholarships to Smith. And one named Joyce Everett is now on the Smith College faculty and got her Ph.D. from Smith as well as her MSW. So that was before the Civil Rights Act was passed in 1964. And uh, I'm proud of that. I wish the program, wish we had enough money to have it continued. We had some government help, but it was very limited. It was very hard to sustain the financial support. Now I want to say a couple of words about some things that weren't so good. I want to uh, go on record as saying that I was disappointed in only one major thing that happened at USC while I was there, and that is that when Dr. Carl Schaefer and I were on a subcommittee to explore the possibility of developing and, and implementing and implementing a clinical social work doctorate, our efforts were not very successful. We had the rudiments of such a program. Uh, uh, we had all the ingredients we needed, but we did not have the support of the then dean. Uh, and uh, I feel badly about that because... Carl is an eminent clinician. He had been president of the Society of the Clinical Social Workers, had years of experience working with children, adults, families, uh, absolute 100% integrity. Uh, and he and I had developed clinical internships. We were going to have clinical research opportunities so the students could do their doctoral dissertation in some area of interest, and a few of them did that. We had a pilot program. We may be three or four students. I hope you remember, Carl. And they were placed at Cedar sinai D.D. Hirsch, Foothill Family Service, among other places. And they loved the experience. They had supervision, and they did dissertations. They did extremely well. And USC missed out on a great opportunity uh, to attract those students who otherwise might go to the Ph.D. program run by the Society of Clinical Social Workers or the non-university-affiliated programs such as uh, CSPP, uh, uh, whatever it's called, the Los Angeles School of Professional Psychology that uh, does not operate within a university framework. Another source of regret I have is that at one time I was, uh, in an ill-advised way, enthusiastic about the possibilities of managed care, thinking naively, I'm going back probably 15 years, that managed care, as it promised, uh, as it originally promised, would provide services to people who ordinarily couldn't afford them in the mental health field. As it turned out, I consider managed care largely a disaster, a way for insurance companies and entrepreneurs to make a lot of money, to give less service, violating client privacy and confidentiality, creating layers of bureaucracy between the client and the therapist. And uh, it's not that I gave any speeches in support of it, but I, I thought it was a promising development. Uh, and it has turned out, from my point of view, to be uh, uh, capitalism at its worst. Uh, and I feel very badly about that. While I'm reminiscing, one thing that I think clinical social workers aren't doing enough of, and, uh, and that is in providing group therapy. I think group therapy is a powerful medium for helping people, not always instead of, but often as a supplement to individual or couple therapy. And for some reason, it has not caught on as, uh, as much as it deserves to. I know uh, for a while I volunteered at D.D. Hirsch, Community Mental Health Center, and myself led a few groups, crisis groups, and I found it to be a valuable experience. The therapy was very effective, and I can't quite figure out why Group therapy is such an underutilized resource. One final comment. Whereas we used to be 
we used to draw our clinical wisdom from ego psychology and psychosocial theories. It seems to me that today's social work students have not heard of Florence Hollis, Gordon Hamilton, Annette Garrett, and some of these really great women in social work who offered us profound insights, not only into social work, but into the human condition. And instead of uh, drawing more on our social work roots, a lot of people uh, develop the theoretical orientation primarily from object relations and self-psychological theories, which have their own value, but uh, they, th these theories could be integrated into the social work fund of knowledge. After all, social workers are very borrowers and adapters of social science and behavioral science knowledge generally. And I regret that they are missing out on this great heritage and uh, wish they knew more about the history of social work in general and the history of uh, social work's contribution to mental health services in the last uh, 100 years. Let's see if there's anything else. Well, that's probably more than enough. Okay? I appreciate this opportunity, Carl. Uh, thank you, Howard, for uh, your extensive comments and uh, your valuable insights into um, understanding a little bit more about where we came from as a profession and where, where we are now.